in John 5, 39, the Bible says, search the scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life, they are they that testify of me. Now, that goes to confirm the statement that Paul made to Timothy, that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make the wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So, salvation can only be found in just one man. And that person is Jesus Christ. Our text again is Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. These have been our texts since we started the teaching on salvation. Second Peter and chapter 3, we are reading verse 15 and 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now that is to say, if you check from the Old Testament text of the scripture, until the fulfillment of those things spoken, we only see one thing about God, his long suffering. And the long suffering is not for breakthrough, it's for salvation. God could put up with man just for the purpose of salvation. So the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, had written to you. So Peter acknowledges one thing about P, uh, Paul. That Paul had a, a wisdom. He had a Sophia. Talk, say with me, he had a Sophia. Yeah, Sophia. That, that's a wisdom. That Exactly what we read in 2 Timothy. Where he said, from a child you have known the Holy Scripture. Which are able to make you wise. That word Sophia. From the word Sophizo. And that's exactly what Peter acknowledged about Paul. He said, there is a wisdom given to him. And the wisdom was to write about salvation. Now look at verse 16. Verse 16 now reads, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. What would be these things? Salvation. Because he didn't write any other thing. That means that whatever you saw Paul wrote, he wrote on salvation. Whether it is faith, whether it's make full proof of your ministry, whatever instruction, it was in the light of salvation. So he said, in all these things, speaking in them. Now, take note of what I'm about to read now. He said, in which are some things too, too hard, are things hard to be understood. Now, it didn't end there. We they that are unlearned. So, the unlearned persons, they are the people that find it difficult to understand and unstable, the rest with it. So, unstable people and unlearned people find the subject of salvation to be hard. Now take note, the Bible didn't say impossible. It means there is an attention required. There is this diligence you must pay to understand the subject of salvation. If you are in church, let me hear you say amen. amen. Now salvation has been the prophecy over time. From the Old Testament text of the scripture like we have seen this evening. So we'll look straight into the Old Testament. And let's find out when God also spoke about salvation. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19, we'll read it verse 4 to 6. Exodus chapter 19. We are reading from verse 4. If you don't mind, it said, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings. God talking to his children, and brought you unto myself. Because the intention of salvation is God bringing man to himself. Take note. The next verse said, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my command covenant, then you shall be what? A peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Next verse. Please follow me. But does that ring a bell in your heart of any New Testament scripture that sounded that way? We'll find out. He said, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. When you hear a statement like this, something should resonate inside of you. And that is First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where the Bible says, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a peculiar. So we're going to, he said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, 
a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So salvation will mean a call out of darkness. Write it down. So before that time, you were in darkness. So salvation will mean a call out of darkness. So Paul, Peter will write about what was prophesied that has found expression. Hallelujah. So to be saved is to be called out of darkness. To be saved is to be called out of darkness. Now look up with me because that was a prophecy in Exodus chapter 19, verse 3, verse 4 to 6. And we have found out that God wanted a people for himself. So God called us out to himself. Said, write that down. God called us to himself. He called us out to himself. Which goes to confirm that what Moses told the children of Israel has found expression. Praise the name of the Lord. Look at the next verse. So to be in darkness means you are not the people of God. No, keep it in that first Peter chapter 2. We have read verse 9. We are reading verse 10. We have read verse 9. We are reading verse 10 of first Peter chapter 2. Now, so it means that if you say you were in darkness, it means you were an unbeliever before. Now look at which in time past we are not a people. But you were humans, but you were not the people, but are now the people of God. So there are so many people, but they are not the people of God. Salvation is what makes you a child of God. You know, on Sunday we said, God is a God of everybody, a father of those who have come to him in Christ. Did we say something like that? Exactly what we find here. He said, which in time past, we are not the people, but there were people. People lived, but they were not. But are now the people of God. Why? Which had, had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So you write this down. Salvation is God's mercy extended to man. That is the mercy of God. You see, people are busy looking for mercy, but mercy is in what Christ offers. So salvation is the offer of God's mercy to man. Glory be to God. I didn't hear that amen. Now, but we'll dwell on verse 9 again. Verse 9. Don't forget what we read in Exodus. It said, I will make you a kingdom of priests. I many of you remember? A kingdom of priests. So he said, but you are a chosen generation. What again? A royal priesthood. That shows a kingly priesthood. The word royalty speaks, speaks about kingship. So a kingly priesthood. Now, an holy nation, a peculiar people. But when the Bible talks about priesthood, where do we find all of this? Because scriptures, we have to explain scriptures. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Let's see what the Bible says. We'll be coming back here. This is how we do Bible study. Bible study is done this way. If what was spoken about us in the Old Testament, we have found it, found as, uh, uh, we have found it now. Let's see if there are other words to corroborate what has happened. He said, I'm from Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead? Now, you know, we learn a lot. What's the meaning of the first begotten from the dead? The first to be raised. That's the resurrection is a begotten from the dead. Now, and the prince is a prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us. Are you saying that it's in the past tense? God is not about to love you. Stop praying for God to love you. God has loved you. Hallelujah. That's a shouting verse. You didn't hear what I just said. That's a shouting verse. He said that unto him that, have lo that loved us and washed us from our sins in where? In his own blood. Join me read verse 6. You will like this. And had made us kings and priests. That's the royal priesthood. Hold it for a moment. That's the royal priesthood. So that prophecy that was in Exodus 19, verse 4 to 6, where he said, I'll make you a kingdom of priests. We find it in salvation. So salvation is royalty. Come on, church. A royalty where priests are being birthed. So a royal priest is a minister to men. So we are priests to minister to men. 
Because every high priest is to offer up sacrifices. We'll find all of that as we make progress. Now, but there's something we read that I have not been able to flesh out. So we we'll take me back to 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll spend a lot of time there. 1 Peter 2 and of course Exodus will be there. So 1 Peter chapter 2, we are still there. Please, you know where we, were read, we read before? Verse 9. Verse 9, that's where we were. It said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10, please follow me. It said, which in time past were not the people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now. What do you have? What do you have now? Peter has also, Peter talked about this in chapter 1. So let's look at chapter 1 of First Peter. Chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. Verse 2 to 3. It says, He let according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto Sorry, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Everybody read verse 3. That's where I'm taking you to want to go. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us on, again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Does that confirm the fact that we had no mercy before, but now we have mercy? Raise up your right and say, I have obtained mercy found in the salvation that I enjoy today. So salvation, like I said earlier on, is an extension of God's mercy to undeserving humanity. You know, I get so confused when I see people still crying, God's covenant day of mercy. There's no covenant day of mercy. The only day of mercy was the offering of Christ for humanity. And anyone that accepts what Christ has done has obtained what? What's the meaning of obtained? Past tense, present tense, or future tense? Past tense. So what you have, would you be looking for it again? So say with me, I have mercy. I have mercy. You know, I see people, oh God, I have mercy. Oh, I have mercy. Sometimes, Probably they are not prop they are not taught. Verse ten, First Peter chapter two, verse ten. We'll read it again. So we, you, we have First Peter two, verse ten. Let's read it again. One, two, go. Verse ten. Which in time past were not a people, but are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now hold it. What's the meaning of now? So any time now you have mercy. Stop looking for what was never lost. Write that down. Stop looking for what was never lost. The mercy of God is upon your life. The fact of scripture is this. That you are a peculiar person. You are a priest. You are a treasure in God's hand. And you must remain as that. Somebody say amen. Still on this, First Peter chapter 2, skip to verse 5. Skip to verse 5. Let's read verse 5. It says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. And what? Holy priesthood. So what do you do as a priest? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So salvation has made you a priest. True? True? Revelation confirms that. We have read several scriptures to confirm that. But what will be the duty of the priest? Now I want you to write down. Sacrifices will be what we do for men. What men do to men, to serve men, is what we call spiritual sacrifices. I say that again. What men do to men, to serve men, is spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices is not getting an animal to burn and say, God, I give you this. Now, what I do to men by way of serving men, what I'm doing now is my act of spiritual sacrifice 
teaching you the word of God. Because priests are meant to serve others. So when you say you are a royal priesthood, it means you are a kingly one. Salvation is how God produces his king or his kings. Write that down. Salvation is how God produces his kings. That's how he produced a royal priesthood. It was in salvation. The purpose of his death and resurrection is that in all of this, a new priesthood will come forth. In the Old Testament, we had priests such as Aaron. But you see, their work was an unending sacrifice, an unending work. But Jesus became the first high priest that in his sacrifice, he sat down. The rest stood because their work was continuous. But Jesus sat because his work was complete. Let's see that. Hebrews 1 verse 3. Hebrews 1 3. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. You know this is how we learn. Hebrews 1 3. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Amen. Who being talking about Jesus, the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. What did he do? Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Question, why did he sit? No more work. Come on, no more work. Say it with me, no more work. No more work. So we are now priests and our priesthood is to serve other men the grace of our Lord Jesus. Say to your neighbor, my duty is to serve men the grace of our Lord Jesus. So salvation is how God made kings of us. And so this is very important. When you hear people say, I'm a king, I'm a priest. Without salvation, you were not a people, but now you have become the people of God. You were in darkness, and now you are in light. And that goes to confirm what Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. In Colossians 1 verse 12, 13 and 14, Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, never saw them. Giving thanks to, unto the Father, which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Because you are no longer in darkness. Who had delivered us. Are you about to be delivered or you have been delivered? delivered. This is the real deliverance. The casting out of devils is different from deliverance. Casting out of devils is different from del deliverance is what we have had. Deliverance is a movement. Write it down. Deliverance is a movement from one kingdom to the other. So what Christ did, the Bible says that we were not the people. We were in darkness. So what he did, he delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us. That is the movement. So deliverance is a movement and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That goes to confirm what we have read both in Exodus 19, 1 Peter chapter 9, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. He said, you are a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into where? His marvelous light. So salvation is a call from darkness. Did you hear what I just said? Salvation is a call from where? Darkness. So, the reason we are saved is because we are saved to be priests. So, what would be the duty of priests? Philippians 4.18. We have defined that before. That what men do to men to serve men is what spiritual sacrifices is all about. But I have all, Paul talking to the church in Philippi, and are bound and full. Having received of what? Epaphroditus, the things which were sent. Watch. From you. Watch it. An odor of what? A sweet smell. A what? So what is the work of a priest? To offer sacrifice. To serve men. So Paul said, you church in Macedonia, you sent a gift to me. That gift was a spiritual sacrifice. What I do for Sister Joy, what I do for Benedita, what I do for Stephen, put your name there, you think I can mention everybody's name. What I do for you is my act of spiritual sacrifice 
Am I communicating? So spiritual sacrifice is not the act of burning incense. It's the act of serving men. Because this is what we found in Christ. Christ served us so that we can serve others. He said, I lay down my life for you. You lay down your lives for others. This is what we call spiritual sacrifice. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Is it clear enough? So the spiritual sacrifice will be what we do for others because royalty is upon our lives. Somebody say amen to that. Let's do something and lead you. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, see what Jesus did in the salvation. And that's how God brought, himself to, uh, brought us to himself. He said, but be ye not unequally yoked together with unbeliever for what fellowship and righteousness with unrighteousness. So by the act of salvation, you have been declared righteous. Amen. Are you seeing it now? For those who are still in darkness, they are called unrighteousness. And what communion had light with darkness? Now, for salvation has brought you into light, you are no longer in darkness. Look at the next time. And what concord had Christ with Belial? Or what part had the believer with an infidel? Watch this. And what agreement is the temple of God? So salvation is how God made you his temple, his dwelling place. Write it down to help you. Because the Bible calls you, and what agreement are the temple of God with idols? So what will be an idol? An idol will be anything apart from what God offers in Christ. So a man who is not saved is in darkness and is in idolatry. Can I say that again? A man who is not saved is in darkness and is in where again? Idolatry. And this we must say. We are saying this so that you understand that the, it was through salvation you became God's temple. He said, and that goes to confirm First Peter chapter 2 verse 5 where the Bible says we are built up a spiritual house. How was that house built? In salvation. Can somebody say amen to that? Look at it. You also, thank you, media, thank you so much. Fantastic. You also are lively stones, are built of what? A spiritual house. So it was in salvation we became God's temple. True? We are built up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer of sacrifices to serve Stephen, to serve Lucky, to serve Mercy. To serve Charles. And that's why through salvation we serve other people. That is our act of spiritual priest or our spiritual sacrifices as priests and kings that we are. That's why it's a royal kingly priesthood. And this kingly priesthood is not in the dress you put on, it's in the activity or your action towards others. Your activity or actions towards others. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Now never you forget that the way God separated us from darkness was to wash our sins. True? You remember how he said it in Matthew one twenty one. Let's put it up. Matthew one twenty one. before we tidy up. Please, I want to remain with this spiritual house. That's where we'll close tonight. I will just stay there and we'll close tonight there. Alright. He said, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. What will he do? For he shall save his people from their sin. So sin can be seen as darkness. Is it? True? Is it darkness? Yes. Because we're saved from it. And Jesus did that so well. And that is why today we have obtained mercy. And you and I, we are saved. Now pastor, why is this so important? The truth of the matter is what religion offers us today a lot of Christians are confused. Today, they are hot. Tomorrow, they are cold. It's a byproduct of what they are feeding on. When you, when you believe rightly, you will live rightly. But when your system of belief is faulty, your manner of life will be faulty. Am I communicating? All right, let's continue with this temple issue. What did I say? Let's continue with this temple issue. How do I put it this way? Let's start with Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, please. Amos. Amos. Good. Join me. I'll wait. I'll wait for you. 
Amos. In that day, will I raise up the tabernacle? Take note of the word. The tabernacle is a temple of David that is falling and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise it, I will raise up his, his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, the tabernacle of David. Watch. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and all and of all the hidden, which are called by the name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is that this was a prophecy. But how to better understand this prophecy will be, where was it referenced in the New Testament? Okay? So, we'll see where it was referenced in the book of Acts of the Apostles. So, let's see what it will have to say. Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 15, from verse 14, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, okay. Now, this was the Jerusalem Council. How many of you remember that we have had time to deal with this? When they, they had some issues with Pharisaic oppression, where they felt people must be circumcised. Hello? All right. Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. To take out of them. How? A people for his name. How? And to this agree the word of the prophet. One, you are too fast. The word of the prophet Amos. The word of the prophet as it is written. So let's see what is written that we have read. After this, I will return and I will build the tabernacle of what? I will build again what? The tabernacle of David, which is falling down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Next verse. That the residue, residue of men might seek after the Lord. So the building will be in the death, burial, and resurrection, so that the Gentiles can have a part in God. That is the tabernacle of David. Tabernacle of David is not a place. It's not a location. It's in what Christ has done. Jesus was referred to as the son of David. True or false. So the tabernacle of David is God building men in Christ. And you are that temple. Did we read something about the temple? That's why I said I would dwell more there. So when he said I will return, it means salvation is God returning to build Men as his temple. I repeat that again. When the Lord said, I will return, simply means salvation is God returning to build men as his temple. So in salvation, men became God's temple. Because God never dwells in any temple made with hands. For ye are the temple of the living God. So God builds men, or God builds by men seeking him. So as you seek the Lord through his word, you are saved, and this is how God built men. Now, I, they have taken me back again. So ye also, as lively stones, are what? Built up a spiritual house. And holy priesthood. How did this happen? God building the tabernacle of David that was in ruins. In building that tabernacle, he made men his temple. Somebody say amen to you. Can I, can I play with your mind a little bit? Maybe we skip to verse 7. Let's get back to verse 7 of Acts. We will read down to, we'll read 7 and we'll read verse 19. And then we'll go back to Acts 7. Acts 15, verse 7. Acts 15, Verse 7. Hear what the Bible says. It says, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and do what? He said, and God which knoweth the heart bear witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their what? 
By faith. So how did God do this? Through the preaching. So we give, we serve men by preaching today. What did I say? And who are we? We offer up spiritual sacrifices because we are priests. Say with me, I'm a priest. I'm a, priest. a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood. To, serve to serve men. Now, look at how Paul said it, that through my mouth. So how do we pass this thing on? Through our mouth. Verse 18 and 19. We read verse 17 before. We haven't read verse 18 and 19. So verse 18 said, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are done what? Turn to who? How, so what do, how do we describe that turning? From darkness? Talk to me. From darkness? How do we describe it? Say it again. From Say it like you mean it from darkness. All right. Let's do something again. Acts 26. Acts 26. I will not have all the time to read through. But let me read 17. But my emphasis will be 18. This was the defense of Paul before killing Agrippa. What had happened to him? 17 and 18. He said, delivering thee from the people. And from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Join me read. To open their eyes and to turn them from where? So what would be darkness? See, you are, fun, you are wonderful people. So darkness to light. Uh -huh, and from the power of Satan. So the power of Satan will be darkness. The power of Satan will be sin. Are you getting it now? Unto God, that is light, that they may receive what? Forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So this is what salvation offers. And we must take to heart that the tabernacle of David that was rebuilt was actually God sending salvation to men and by so doing, making man his temple. I need to trouble you a little bit. A good one. Acts 7. Acts 7. I like to read verse 46. 7, 47, 48. Please, Acts 6. Thank you. This was Stephen's message. Stephen was preaching. Who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle? They were looking for what? A tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Watch this. And join me read. I wait for you. Join me read. I know you are writing. But Solomon built him. Watch. Read with me. How be it? The most high dwelleth not in temples made with hand. I see it. So the prophet had been saying it, but men were still building. Look at it. Next verse. God never lived in any temple. Look at what he said. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? See the Lord. Or what is the place of my rest? Had not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart. And yes, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So God has never lived in any temple. The only temple God made for himself. The temple that are here today. The temple that have received the gospel. He, he built the tabernacle of David again. Restored the realm. And that is how God built men as his temple. So salvation is how God made men his dwelling place. And God is not afraid of you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's not afraid. He comes to live with you and live in you that very moment. You know, people think, I'm too dirty for God to come in. Salvation is a cleaning method of God so that he cannot dwell in man. 
So as at the time he was saying, the tabernacle of David is God building men in Christ. When he was saying, I will build again the tabernacle of David, he was saying salvation will come to man. That true salvation, God will not have a place because God never lived in any temple made with hands. Is that clear enough? Come on, talk to me. Is that clear enough? Now, I'm not true. Sorry. I just want to be sure. Now, look at, in the Old Testament, men built temple for God, but God never requested for any of those things. Let me do this. In Isaiah 66, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Isaiah 66. Thoughts hear the Lord. The heaven is my throne. And we are? So the question I want to ask, what is the purpose of heaven and earth? Man. You know, we said we'll do a teaching on that. If God does not live in any temple, and he said, heaven is my throne, the earth is my truth too. And where he dwells now, man has become his temple. Man is God's heaven. <laughs> uh, because you are the temple of the... He said, thus he the Lord. The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you built unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things had my hand made. And those things have, have been, said the Lord. But this man will I look, even to him that is poor, without, of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. That is where I want to live in. I don't want to live in a physical temple. So restoring the tabernacle of David was God's way of making man his dwelling place. So when you hear the psalmist say, You are my dwelling place, my tower of strength, and not your throne. Oh, grace, I humbly bow. Salvation became that process where God cannot inhabit man. Am I communicating? This reminds me of what Jesus will say. He looked at the temple. He said, destroy this temple. This temple. After three days, I will build it. They said this temple had been in beauty for 46 years. But they didn't understand. He spoke about the temple of his body. But when he was raised, his disciples remember that he spoke about that. That the temple where God will be worshipped will not be a temple made with hands. It will be the temple of men. Men who have been delivered from darkness into his marvelous light. Therefore, he cannot say, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a peculiar nation. You, you have been called out to show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. The redemption from sin is a call out of darkness. The forgiveness of sin is a call out of darkness. Redemption is God's masterpiece. The highest that God would do was to redeem sinful man that could not lift a finger up to save himself. God became man for the purpose of saving man. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Let's read Hebrews 2. You know, this thing gets to you when you start talking about this thing. As you start understanding this thing, it's like your, your spirit will leave your body. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. He said, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took parts of the same. He became one of us. He became one like us. You didn't hear what I just said. He became one of us. He became one like us. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. He became me to redeem me. Oh, he that knew no sin became sin for me. That I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, we must understand what salvation is all about. That we did on Sunday. We're taking a step further today. We are that priceless treasure of God. Look at your neighbor say, you are valuable. valuable. Say like you mean is you are valuable. valuable. Salvation made you valuable. Salvation made you valuable. Write it down. Salvation made me to be valuable. Valuable. I became valuable because of salvation. Became the treasure God talked about. I became the pre pre uh, peculiar treasure God talked about. And this is the work of salvation. Glory be to God. You didn't hear me. I said, glory be to God. 
I'm excited. He became one of us. Put it in NLT. Let me read in NLT. I'm almost through for tonight. Did you learn anything so far? Oh God. He said because God's children are human beings. Made of flesh and blood. The son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Who had the power of death. I see here some people who get confused. They say God keys. The Bible is so clear about that. The devil has the power of death. God does not have the power of death. In John 10, 10, it said the thief comes to what? Steal, to kill, and to destroy. I came that you may have life. First John chapter 1, verse 5. He said, this is the message. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. So when I see, see people, especially preachers, who still argue that God is a killer, and we see God in Christ, how he walked the earth, and yet never killed everyone that had need. He went there. And, you know, it was documented by Luke in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, from verse 38. He said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. He wouldn't have done this if he had the power of death. The power of death has always been with the devil. We have an, the death is an enemy. The Bible says so in 1 Corinthians. I'm sure chapter 15 verse 25 and 26. Said the last enemy to be destroyed is death. To God, death is an enemy. How will God use his enemy to fight his enemy? I don't know if I'm communicating. God never killed. God will never kill. And what God has done in the death of his son, he has brought salvation to humanity. The tabernacle of David, as prophesied by Amos, has come to pass. And that's what was stated in Acts 15. He said, to this, the prophet spoke about, I will restore again the tabernacle of David that is falling. So the tabernacle of David will be a people that God will live in. That's the dwelling place of God. And you are that dwelling place today. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can't share that body with the devil because the devil never paid a price for you. You are bought with a price. First Corinthians chapter 6 says so. Glory be to God. He said you are bought with a price. Hallelujah. I didn't hear that. Amen. I say hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20. Or oh, let me read from verse 19. From verse 19, we'll close there. Hallelujah. My time is up. Verse 19. Say, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, not another one, which we, you have of God, and you are not on your own. Join me read the last verse. T 20. One to go. For you bought with a price. Therefore, hold it. Lay hands on your body. I glorify God in this body. This body will serve the purpose of Christ. This body will serve the cause of Christ. This body remains strong. Accident can't force this body out of this world. Sickness can't force this body out of this world. Nothing forces this body out of this world. No part of me is weak. My kidney functions well. My liver functions well. My, my lungs functions well. My heart functions well. Every vital organ of my body functions well. This body has been bought. This alone is enough to rise up and take your place. He said, for you are bought with the price. The receipt of the blood of Jesus is over your life. It is the Holy Spirit in you. It's a down payment. You are bought with a price. Say, therefore, glorify God. We are. This body serves the cause of Christ. Satan, you have lost it forever. My body cannot serve the purpose of the devil. I glorify God in my body. Come on, I thought you would do something like I glorify God in my body. My bones are strong. My joints are strong. My ligaments strong. 
my arteries strong, my nerves functions well, my blood purify. Hey, Stavaga! Sickness has lost that address of my body. This is how God made a temple for himself. The tabernacle of David. That was a ruin has been built again. In the death, burial, and resurrection, a new species of people have emerged. They are called chosen generation. They are called royal priesthood. They are called unholy nation. They are called peculiar to show forth. This body is for showing forth. Not for sickness. You didn't hear me. This body is for showing forth. It's not for sickness. Therefore, you will never have a cause to be bedridden. You will never have a cause to be kept in the, in the, in the hospital. I speak over your vital organs. They function well. Valizuki tamanga peki sutepe. Every part of you that was not functioning well. Come on, I release life by the spirit. If the spirit that raised up Jesus dwells in you, that same spirit vitalizes your mortal body. Your body was bought with a price. Hallelujah. Satan, get lost. This body has been bought. This body has been bought. I said, this body has been bought. The real places of the tabernacle of David has been built back again. The devil has no place in me. He lost my address over 2,000 years ago. You didn't hear me? He lost my address 2,000 years ago. The Barachi Kenemba Gadaba. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. You see what salvation offers us? We've left dark. We are in this marvelous life. We, we are not the people. We have become the people. We became the temple of God. We became a royal priesthood. And then you are bought with a price. So there is a price over your head. And nobody can take off that price. The only way the will of the devil can come to pass in your life is that he pays a price for you. And again, even if he pays a price, you are not willing to accept his price. There's one we have accepted. Jesus of Nazareth. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Bless tonight. Come on. Bless tonight. How do you feel? Bless tonight. That's the dwelling place of God. That's the dwelling place of God. They are living here with a renewed vigor and strength. Renewed vitality. Knowing what salvation has brought to you today. The real tabernacle of David has been built again. That devil has no part in you. Bless tonight. I feel like jumping up. I just feel like shouting. Glory! I say glory! Woo! Glory! You see, when the word of God comes alive like this, nothing stops you. Hallelujah. Let me pray. Father, thank you for a wonderful time such as this. Thank you for our eyes can see. Thank you because we perceive. Thank you because we understand. Thank you because we live in the reality of what you have done. We pray for all those that are watching by internet. We ask the same grace abound. And Lord, we stop every manipulation and maneuver of the devil against their body. And Lord, we speak that their body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That the real tabernacle of David has been built again. Therefore, Satan has lost their address. We celebrate you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.